the sequel yeah i write the code i do the game graphics and pretty much come up with all the design elements for it game yeah, and one of the things eric that um uh it's always been challenging is that because paul always has his nose uh uh based at the computer and coding um i often get credited with um the being the creator of sword of fargle which is true for the the original 1983 sort of Fargo for the Commodore 64, but truly Paul is uh, kind of the genius behind the modern versions of sort of Fargo, and me being kind of the uh, uh, co, I guess, what would you call it, Paul? Co, co, uh, um, partner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, p partner on it, uh, but, but Paul is really, uh, Paul misses out on a lot of these interviews, and, and so I'm really happy that you've been able to include both of us in this. Yeah, well, the more the merrier, so. Um, okay, so I thought we'd start with the first sort of Fargo. Um, what, uh, that, that was, you said that was 1983, so I was two when that came out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's and I, I, I never played it back then, obviously, but I've played it on the, uh, on the iPhone now. Mm -hmm. um, what, what sort of, what was the inspiration there for that, for that game? Well, certainly, like many other people that are credited with working on uh, the so-called roguelike genre, uh, a lot of our roots are in the same places. Uh, I would say that certainly D&D, &D, and I, I played it as a kid. Uh, also, of course, really going back further, the, the Tolkien books, you know, those, those are really inspirations for almost everybody that loves this kind of thing. So those are probably my two biggest influences. Okay. Uh, what now? It's a roguelike. What what exactly qualifies a game as a roguelike? I know Paul is more the uh, uh, expert at this, but certainly it ties back to one of the very earliest versions of a kind of dungeon exploration game that was called Rogue, and it actually came out, I believe, in 1981 uh, or 80, uh, and it was really around the same time that I was developing kind of the precursor for Sword of Fargo, which I started on in high school uh, for the, the Commodore PET computer, which is a precursor of the Commodore 64. And I started working on that in 1979. So it's interesting. There were several people that were kind of inspired by the same influences and I think working on the same types of things. Okay. So, um, why? Uh, so, so there was a, a gap from 1983 to, I believe, 2009, when the uh, iPad version of the game came out. Um, why? Why uh, didn't you create a sequel or, or a new version on an earlier system, uh, or or prior to 2009? Well, I think that I was doing other things with my life. I, I went to NYU Film School. I became a graphic artist. I got involved in creative kind of architecture rescue and, and uh, actually, oddly enough, uh, home house moving, which actually I saved full-sized houses and actually moved them to different locations. So lots of other creative endeavors. I did always maintain a love of and a, col a collecting mentality of, of uh, games of all types, uh, particularly board games, and early in the 2000s, I went directly into actually doing game design again, working for a game, a board game design company in Seattle called Front Porch Classics. And it was around that time that I had been keeping in touch with various Fargo fans over the years, and there were I noticed that there was kind of a this retro resurgence. People really interested in the old C64 games. And there were a few 
sites that were kind of, uh, I guess, retro fan sites, and even one or two that were specific to sort of Fargo, which was very flattering. But I heard from uh, a, uh, a, a pair of coders that were out there in the world that had made a retro remake or kind of a tribute remake of Sword of Fargo for a remake competition. And those people happened to be Paul Pridham, who's right here, and Elias Schering, who is a, an Austrian coder that Paul got to know just from the, the uh, open source coding community. So I'll let Paul take a little bit of that in terms of how kind of the modern era of Sword of Fargo was reborn in 2003. Um, yeah, like Jess said, uh, um, Elias and I kind of hooked up and and uh, he was he was un actually initially he was just working on some game for this other competition which was a, like an RPG generic competition and he was just doing some kind of dungeon game and I kind of popped in and said hey we should remake Sword of Fargo because it's really cool and uh, so we kind of switched gears and uh, started doing that and uh, there was another competition around the same time for retro remakes and so we kind of dual entered it into that as well but we spent probably about two weeks on it and a lot of that time we spent um, we detokenized the original uh, C64 basic code and we figured out how everything worked and kind of re-implemented all the algorithms and stuff as, as closely as we could to uh, to match the original experience uh, uh, really carefully and uh, there were a couple little changes we made that we thought um, were kind of necessary for uh, for more modern, not like it's a real modern uh, game or anything, but just uh, we gave people some different options and stuff, and uh, and then we uh, released it. So yeah, it was it was fun, Eric, um, because when Paul reached out to me, uh, I first of all I was really impressed at how faithfully they reproduced the original in terms of its spirit. And like Paul said, they did introduce some new, kind of more um, slightly perspective graphics and uh, things like that. But ultimately, that kind of prompted us to team up, and we ended up uh, basically forming a uh, an LLC together, which led to our ongoing communications about possible future versions. And we kept in touch over the years, and I... I kept bringing up the idea of maybe doing kind of a modern smartphone version, and we each of us kind of had full-time jobs and and didn't really have an opportunity to, to make it real until um, I had gotten wind of the new Apple iPhone, and I said, uh, "Hey, Paul, <laughs> this is a this is a device we should consider actually doing the uh, the kind of the new the newest version on." And, and luckily, Paul and Elias agreed, and and that's uh, that's what led to the the 2009 version. How was that version, um, wh what changed between the original version and the, the iOS version? I mean, other than just, you know, obviously the touch-based mechanics. Certainly it's very different visually. Uh, one of the things that's been fantastic is Paul um, ended up uh, really becoming a true pixel artist when he started working on the new versions. I mean, he'd already kind of experiment around with pixel art and and ha was good at it but but I think that through the the new versions there was a real evolution of the the quality and just the level of uh, of finish and I'll, I'll certainly let Paul speak to that I know he'll also talk a little bit about the the SID sound simulator that he also created for the for the device so so it was really a nice balance of an honoring of the original intent and style, but with uh, with a real uh, nod toward what certainly modern gamers are more used to as well. So, Paul, why don't you take the rest of that one? Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, uh, I made the new graphics, and they're really uh, I try to keep them derivative of the old original Commodore graphics, just just so you can still recognize everything, but you know, more detail and kind of have its own little kind of cute style to it. And, uh, and yeah, the, uh, the sound effects were probably one of the biggest things that, that, that impacted me about that game back in the day. And uh, I decided I wanted to have a sound synth that was very similar to uh, Commodore 64's sound synth, and so I figured out how to do that. And uh, 
slap it in the game and all of the sound effects are, uh, well, the original sound effects were translated essentially from how they were programmed on the C64 into my synth, so you get the, sound, the same kind of sound effects, and then I created all sorts of new ones as well. Um, aside from that, you know, there are lots of different tweaks. The, uh, the dungeon is persistent now. It doesn't get regenerated uh, when you go up and down the stairs. Um, added some, some different items and things like that, like there's shields that you can get, and there's some, some uh, different potions, and the, the shields have different qualities, like, uh, for instance, the, uh, the macabre shield, kind of a, a favorite one. It's all bones, and uh, when you hit it, if you, or if, you're, if you block with it, it screams, <laughs> and it can sometimes sort of stun or paralyze or, or cause fear in your enemy, which weakens him for, opens, opens him up for attack, so... One of many things that uh, that we, we tweaked, uh, and you know, just the numbers and everything that, that went with the game. Try to try to make it a little faster paced. The original was was kind of notorious for having to sit around and wait a lot to heal, and especially uh, you know on uh, Commodore 64, it wasn't running fast to begin with. So I've heard stories of people having to go and basically they would go do the wash or something while they're waiting for their <laughs> guy to heal on the temple. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so I was just going to add to that. One of the things that that is uh, definitely a big factor is that when when you think back to how the original game was created, it uh, its entire coding was done within the namesake of the Commodore 64, which is 64K. In fact, the entire program written largely in BASIC with a few assembly language routines that I uh, actually got help from a friend uh, to to enhance the speed of the game in certain areas was fit in 14K. So that compared to the massive size of the the current code is is uh, is is pretty remarkable. I think at some point during the interview, Paul can kind of relate the the relative scales between, of course, the original to the uh, 2003 remake, the 2009 version, and then of course the upcoming. Um, uh, early 2013 version, sort of Fargo 2, which which uh, I'm sure we'll get to. Well, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, go ahead, Paul. Um, well, the original Commodore version, I think, is 500 lines of basic. Yeah. There's a lot packed in there, though. I mean, you know, you get the right numbers, you can really, really crunch things down. Um, uh, the iOS version, or iOS, however you want to say it, it's I don't know exactly how, how big it is, the, the 2009 ones, probably around 500, or sorry, 50,000 lines. And, I mean, so much of that is just kind of the grunt work under the hood that you, you need in order to uh, set things up and all that, but also uh, all the sound effects and everything. It just, it, uh, it really uh, pads things out. And the, uh, the new one is, is uh, around 100,000 lines right now. So it's, it's uh, you know... Uh, orders of magnitude uh, more <laughs> code, but so and you you guys were about uh, I think it said on your Kickstarter page about eighty percent completed uh, complete with the game before you started a Kickstarter drive. Uh, what made you decide to use Kickstarter and to uh, go the crowdfunding route? Well, certainly the biggest factor is that we probably got to a certain point within the game development and realized just how massive the new undertaking was. And already at that point, Paul in particular had spent many, actually hundreds of hours that actually added up to a few thousand hours of, of coding time already. So he had already spent, you know, uh, Paul, I, I, I know your working habits are, are very long during a day. I, I've been quoting about uh, uh, 12, 12 to 14 hours. Is that fairly accurate in terms of how many hours per day you were working on it? For the, yeah. yeah, pretty much, and I didn't take off any weekends. I mean, you know, the odd, the odd day or whatever, but pretty much seven days a week, twelve to fourteen hours a day. And uh, when I was um, originally working on it, I was also full time job. So I mean, I couldn't work that much, but you know, I'd end up being working till five in the morning or something like that, <laughs> just to try to get things done because I really wanted to, you know, do this. One wanted to do this and make this, you know, the way that I 
that I made my income and everything and, and kind of get out of the other more boring types of jobs I've had. So this is what I figure I'm good at, so it's what I should be putting all my effort into. Um, yeah. So yeah, for Fargo 2, it's probably been about 5,000 hours that I've put into it so far. And uh, that's been a big drain on my bank account, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that uh, we get it finished and all polished up and and uh, and people really like it and buy a whole lot of it. <laughs> and, and Eric, what what it really translates to is that with Kickstarter, it it really lets us um, well it lets it lets Paul know that he can really s stick to the game with the same level of of time commitment that he has been, as well as bringing in some extra resources, for example, because Paul does everything, he does the, the coding and the sounds and, and the pixel art, it does mean that it slows down the whole progress of the game. And so if he was doing it all alone, then it would mean that it, that it really would, particularly with the budgetary constraints, take until really 2014. I mean, we, we recognize that fans have been very patient with us, and we, we really want to make it much faster that we get it done. And so it lets us hire additional pixel art and, and coding resources as we need them, as well as, of course, keeping Paul working on the core of the game. And, uh, and, and so it, it, it means that we can get it finished you know, way ahead of what it would have been had we continued on the, on the current pathway. Okay. How, what was your experience using Kickstarter? Was, was, that, um, was it what you expected? Was it a lot more work? I suppose it's not finished because you have all the, the pledge rewards and, and different things like that that still have to probably go out. Uh, what, what's, what's the experience been like? Well, I think that if people watched the end of the, uh, the campaign and the, you know, the, those last 10 minutes or so, and then, of course, our reactions afterward, and Paul's already teased me about this on, on Twitter, but it was quite emotional for me, I have to say. I mean, I... I I recognized how important it was that we made it across the finish line with a positive uh, result, uh, and 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 that was a huge relief for I think all of us because it's not that we wouldn't have been able to, you know, do a new Kickstarter campaign and and regroup and stuff like that, but it was so much work. I mean, I've been working on it for about two to three months in preparation, and then of course solid a month on the actual campaign itself and uh, my experience overall has been remarkably uh, I guess growing experience. I, I, I think that one of the things about a Kickstarter campaign is if you really take it seriously and you put your heart into it like you do in developing a game for example then it actually even helps you I think prepare better for the work that you're doing on the game. So it meant that you know we had to think hard about you know what the remaining content was going to be in the game and how to express that to people and how to reach out to the press and uh, how to get discovered more by people that we know will like the game. And Kickstarter really puts you into a mode where that's what you're doing 20, you know, well, maybe not 24 hours a day, but sometimes 18 hours a day uh, for a, you know, 30 to 60 day stretch. And that was certainly my own personal experience. Okay. Um, so what what is changing now between the uh, the most recent sort of Fargo and the sequel? Like what what's being added? Are there um, are there changes in the gameplay? Uh, what what's going to be the big difference? Well, this is where I'm really excited about Paul being on because I can talk about it in general terms, and but there are even some things that that Paul has kept secret from me because he likes to do a reveal. He likes to when we share, uh, you know. Uh, various playtest versions, you know, he likes me to kind of discover things. Uh, I don't know if Paul will reveal any secrets during this, but maybe he will. Let's find out. Paul, what, what would you say are the key differences? I'd say probably the biggest change for the game is that when you move right, the guy flips around and moves right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is um, true, but it's... <laughs> there's, uh, one of the things that people, I think, I mean, they really like the game and its and its simple interface, and they really wanted to keep that. Like, there's a lot of roguelikes or other dungeon games. You'll see they got tons of buttons on the screen and stuff, and that's something we we don't want to stay. I mean, we don't want to get into um, 
but yet we still want to add a lot of cool new features. So it's been kind of a, a big balancing act there to, to make sure that we can do that. So, uh, well, one of the things is uh, uh, there's a, I rewrote how the dungeons are generated and everything, so they're a lot more flexible. Um, there are you can have all these side branches and, and quests and stuff, and there's these different dungeon types like uh, like caves with with sand. You'd be able to dig in there and look for treasure, and there's water that you can splash around in and have water beasts and um, the dungeons are a lot more. I guess you could say they seem like they're more constructed with intent, so they don't seem quite as you know random dungeon generation. It's it's a lot more like it seems like there's a there's a bigger purpose to this dungeon. You've got sort of like maintenance sort of paths where you end up going down these shafts and stuff like that. And there's a, there's an actual dungeon area which is really dangerous. And then there's a, more of a, like a keep area where you see a lot of the guards and their vaults and and more of the uh, treasures and that kind of thing. And then you get into these side branches like like sewers and stuff. You might fall down a, a sewer grate and you end up in the sewer with these uh, crazed rats and, and disgusting oozes and things like that and you got to fight your way out of there. So so that's that's one thing about it but also um, we, you know, people really like to, the, the whole thing with Fargo is you're, you're kind of telling this story as you play, like the, the player themselves are making the story, and we wanted to uh, really expand that. So we've added some character classes. Uh, right now, there's uh, there's four classes. So you can be fighter, ranger, uh, thief, and a uh, magic user. And uh, there will be more to come. I was working on a monk back uh, a while back before I had to sort of take a hiatus and, and do uh, make some money. <laughs> but um, um, also, there are lots of items now. Um, the Sword of Fargo, the original one, and the 2009 remake, there was no real, like, you had a sword, you know, that was your weapon, and there was really nothing else done with that. It basically, you just get it enchanted, and it does more damage. And now, I mean, there are tons of different items, uh, probably around 100 different weapons you can get now, and uh, these are all, I've done a lot of, like, historical research to see what what kinds of weapons there are, what their weights are, like the, the weapons have heft. So if you're using a rapier versus a, you know, a, a pole arm or, or a mace, it really has a different um, effect based on your character's attributes as well, whether they're, you know, very deft or they, they have, uh, you know, high strength, that kind of thing. So the balance comes into factor. But also these, these uh, items have a lot of other attributes, like um, they can be damaged in. They, they may be rusted or corroded or you may find a really fine example of a, of, a, of a broadsword which is you know just superior to most of the other weapons. Combining that with with things like the enchantments there can now be spells embedded in the objects themselves so you may get a sword that has a special effect on uh, on uh, beasts or, or bugs or, or trolls and, and these types of things uh, they would call in, the, in the, the roguelike circles, they call them an ego weapon, which is basically a weapon that has a special elements attached to it. And, and these things are, are not things that you can, uh, you know, they're, they're usually things that you, you just find this weapon in. It's a specially uh, defined weapon, randomly generated or whatever. So these things are all going to factor into these side quests and everything else that happen in the, in the dungeon. It's not just about getting a sword, although that really is the main goal, but now you, you have a lot of other things you can do. And, uh, and when the quest is over, if you manage to get the sword out, we're going to allow them to go back into the ruins for a totally new uh, experience of, of who knows what. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> new dangers and, and, uh, and, uh, and treasures await. So I'm not really, yeah. I haven't revealed a lot on that, but basically once you get the sword, there's a lot more to come. Well, and I've always loved that you can have something like a a, a bastard sword of troll slaying or something like that. You know, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it, so what what it does is it creates all these these combinations that are that have never existed before. And one of the things that I I've kind of used as a term for both the the item management and what you would find in the dungeon, as well as the the monster behaviors, is that there's this what I would call kind of emergent behavior that happens, things that, that just happen that we haven't even thought about. And uh, 
uh, one of the things I love about how you described it, Paul, is that there can be chain reactions based on what you set up. Like, why don't you describe a little bit about how a combination of traps or spells or things like that might work, for example? Yeah, I mean, the, the items, the weapons are just one thing. There's armor, there's helmets, there's uh, um, rings and amulets and all that kind of stuff. But they're also, uh, you know, I really like to explore. I know, I know uh, um, a lot of roguelikes, they may focus on the combat, and that's cool, but I also like just the unknown and the things that you can do in the dungeon just don't know what's around the corner. And so there are lots of uh, environmental elements to, uh, to the game now um, with items and, and, and chests and things. And, and these are containers that you can put stuff in. You can push them around. You can set a trap in them, or there may already be a trap in there. And the traps can be constructed out of uh, you know, components such as a, you know, like a latch trigger and, and, and an explosive flask. So you can set that up in the chest and then kind of use that as, as a way to take out an enemy. If they're a thief, they may be uh, looking around for loot themselves, so they come across this chest and they pop it open and get an exploding flask in the face. And you can also do things like the explosions will affect other items, so it will damage things around. You could set up a, a bunch of flasks like that and have one explode, which disturbs another one, which then explodes and explodes. <laughs> this goes crazy. And, uh, yeah, flask is, an, is another whole thing. We have these flasks of different kinds, like acid flasks and poison and explosive flasks and toxic flasks, which uh, have their own explosive qualities if they're combined with fire. And, yeah, <laughs> lots of stuff like that, basically. A lot of pretty much everything can be destroyed or pushed around or whatever. You can find a dead body and put it inside of a chest, or you may find one there already, and there's loot under it, and you just, you just don't know what's going <laughs> to what's going to show up. Um, so what about character customization? Um, you mentioned uh, different weapons having different heft and whatnot and maybe being impacted by, uh, like, strength. So do, do players have some level of customization over, over their build? Uh, yeah. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, whatever you equip. Um, if you put on some plate armor and a, and a, and a, a kettle helm and, and you're wielding a an axe, then those things all show up on your character as well. Um, and the different classes look different. Now, I haven't done this yet, but I really want to make the characters completely customizable in their base appearance, like what I've done with, uh, with Punch Quest. I don't know if you've been following that on, on Twitter. But basically, you know, be able to change their skin tone, their hair, the color of their clothes, all that, just to basically allow them to really make a character that they, they can uh, associate with. And, uh, and yeah, as you go through the dungeon, um, these things change. You know, your, your armor changes because you just fought something that's, that's a corrosive acid monster and it ends up rusting your chainmail. And now you've got, you're walking around this brown, rusted chainmail. <laughs> Thought you were looking all sharp before, but now you look like a hobo in the dungeon. <laughs> so, yeah, all these things happen and you would be in the middle of a fight and your stuff breaks and suddenly you've got no weapons at all, and you're, you're duking it out with your fists against a, a werebearer. <laughs> <laughs> now, how are, the, um, how are the different versions of this game going to uh, be different from one another? I mean, you've got, you've got an, I, uh, an iPad version uh, and also one for PC. How is that going to change from one to the next? Um, well, I think... We're pretty much going to try to keep the experience fairly consistent. You know, we we want we'll, we'll adapt to the platform in, in ways that make sense. But as far as the the game underneath, uh, really want to have a, a very similar or identical experience because uh, some of the things that I want to do is to be able to have sort of like challenges where you can basically share the dungeon seed with someone else, and you're both. Um, essentially exploring and, and adventuring in the same dungeon, and then and then you can kind of compare the, the results there. And uh, if things go really well, I'd like to have that be a bit more global so you may end up uh, having a shared seed with someone you don't even know, and then you see where their dead body was, you know, when you enter the game, and, and you know, things can happen, like maybe their items are available to you or their, their uh, zombified corpse starts coming after you. So uh, really have to keep everything... You know, consistent in that in that sense, and the, the platforms really shouldn't have any impact on that. 
Um, well, Eric, one of the things that I think is also true is that the previous versions will still exist in their current form, and one of the things that will be a big distinction between them is, for example, with the current um, iPhone and, and iPad version, they, they'll continue to be, you know, supported as their own uh, apps, and they'll even have their own things in them. For example, the, uh, the first uh, iPhone and iPad versions have these beautiful cutscene animations for going downstairs and, and finding the sword and things like that. And one of the things that Paul was uh, really insistent on, and I think for good reason, with Sword of Fargo 2 is that we're actually changing the way that you experience the game visually uh, as, as a wholesale approach. In other words, the dungeons will look different in their final form. They'll, they'll have some familiar feel to them, but all of the, the pixel art is going to be new and fresh. And in addition, uh, I think, Paul, I forgot if you alluded to the action cards. Uh, we may have talked about it briefly, but the, oh, yeah. the, the thing that will help tell the story is that people will get action cards for the different things that happen to them in the game. And those cards will help capture these moments and... and I, I've always been curious to, to ask Paul. I'm, I'm assuming, let's say you have this epic battle with a with a um, shadow dragon and you win. Will it capture? Will the action card actually capture the stats of that particular battle when you're awarded it, so that you can kind of know what that snapshot was like? Um, I mean, yeah, we can we can do whatever we want with it. Uh, I, I plan on capturing not just the cards, but also pretty much all of the uh, flavor text, as they call it. Yeah. That, so you can really see the whole story, but um, also you, you may end up doing a lot of the same things over and over, and, and wouldn't want to spam the uh, the action card timeline with with you know ten uh, bats in a row kind of thing. So still have to sort of figure out what what's important to keep and what isn't. But I think an epic battle is definitely something that we would want to keep track of. And the idea there, Eric, is that as you progress through the game and certainly after you finish the game you'll be able to actually kind of relive the the those high points those moments and sometimes they can just be as simple as discovering a secret passageway to another dungeon or they might be uh, you know the first time that you opened a chest and found that there was a a, a skeleton inside and you get scared blankless you know <laughs> the those those moments are fun as part of the storytelling and uh, that's one of the things that we've really enjoyed about Sword of Fargo, really back to its original form, which is that rather than giving this um, kind of preamble for you know what the game is going to be about and who you're supposed to rescue and talking to some uh, mage in the town before you go into the dungeon and all that, we really like that you're immediately in the dungeon and you really kind of form your own story. You get this, as, as Paul was referring to, this flavor text. And that kind of starts to tell your own quest. So we're trying to enhance all the aspects of that so that your quest is told in a way that you can kind of remember and save and potentially even, I'm, I'm thinking, Paul, share, share with other people potentially, like if you, if you wanted to share it um, you know, so that they can see what your quest was like um, and, and compare it to maybe one they have or something like that. Um, so what... what uh... Other than the original sort of Fargo, have, have there been any other games or um, board games, video games that have sort of influenced the direction you're taking with the sequel? Uh, Paul, I know that's definitely true for you uh, because you, you, <laughs> one of the things that I, I often talk about in my own experience as a, a, um, a computer game designer is that, that since I designed mine so early on, there's a very long period of you know 20 years or so that that I wasn't actually uh, uh, playing other roguelike games and dungeon crawlers and things like that. So Paul, you know all of that that in between history because you were a player throughout those years. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about some of the influences that you had? Um, well, definitely the way that influences work for me when I'm designing games is. You know, I often look at, and I don't want to sound disparaging, but I often look at flaws as being just as important as the uh, as as the golden elements of, of certain games. So, 
Um, I take in the games uh, with that viewpoint and, and, and use that to help make Fargo both better and, uh, and unique or any game that I'm working on. Um, so, I mean, some of the games that I, that I played in the past that have influenced Fargo are uh, games like Moria, which is a, a precursor to Ang Band, which is a fairly popular roguelike. Um, I've looked at a lot of how these, these games handle the, the systems for their weapons and that kind of stuff. And since, since we've got all these items and weapons now, you know, it's important to do that right. Fargo, uh, for the Commodore, didn't have any of that stuff. So we want to do something that's both familiar um, to players of, of other roguelikes and such, but also that, that makes sense to someone who hasn't played that roguelike. Um, and that hack is another good one. It's, it's, a, it's a really fun roguelike. Uh, so much variety in that game. A lot of it is really nonsensical. <laughs> like some of the combinations of things that can occur, you know, you kick a sink and it, it ends up with a bunch of demonic snakes that come up and attack you. Like, you just have to know these things, right? And that's both good and bad. I think it can, it can make the game pretty hardcore, but it also makes it really interesting and unpredictable. So those kind of thoughts, I think, make their way into Fargo. Um, and some other games that aren't even related to, to, to roguelikes and other movies or experiences, just everything kind of feeds into it that way. A lot of it is, I actually didn't play a lot of D&D. I maybe played a couple games. So a lot of this is my sort of own imagining of what, you know, the dungeon experience is like to, you know, a lot of that stems from playing the original uh, sort of Fargo, and I've, I've got a really active imagination, and, and even more so as a kid. So you, you get all these ideas and images, and, and these are things that you just they just percolate away for years and years, and and, uh, and they come out in a game. Well, if if you can probably hear it in his voice, but Paul <laughs> has a wonderfully uh, wry sense of humor, and one of the things that that I always loved from the beginning with my first version is that. I always wanted to inject and hold on to kind of a sense of fun and a sense of humor in the game. And one of the things that I think has really been enhanced with the modern versions is that we love to interject uh, or inject humor into various aspects of the game. And uh, whether it's through the flavor text, through, through strange creatures or, or weapons or the way we describe something in the battle, uh, and, and that's, that's only being... I guess enhanced and, and added to in, in Sword of Fargo 2 as well. Also, uh, just uh, while we're still talking about influences, um, there are other games such as the old Infocom Adventures. Did you ever play any of those, Eric? I, uh, I'm not sure. Wh which one? Zork. Zork. I played a little bit of that, yeah. That was a long time ago. Did you ever walk into the dark? Oh, you know, it's it's. I don't remember it all that well. I didn't play it a lot. Yeah. Well, if you went anywhere without a lantern, you ended up in a dark area. You were very uh, likely to be eaten by a Gru, and uh, this is now true in Fargo too. So, <laughs> uh, you know, pay, paying uh, homage to other great games that have influenced and cross pollinated all of these ideas for, you know these types of games ever since uh, they came out. It's, 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 uh, there's a lot of things feeding into it. Cool. Um, so at the end of the, I just wanted to touch briefly on, on the success of your Kickstarter. Um, you, you barely, you barely made it. It was down to the last couple of minutes. Um, <laughs> How how do you how do you feel after all that? I, I know you got some help from from some other developers, and um, it was it's kind of a neat a neat story. Well, I, I definitely I, I I can say that I I couldn't really believe how it was playing out, and and I I was you know we we were of course very heartened and encouraged through different stages of the Kickstarter campaign. As we saw various elements of progress, and and somewhat worried during times when it was slow, but all along the way we we got these injections of encouragement, and um, certainly among the biggest were some of these stories that we heard near the end. And one of the things that I've been saying, which I think is absolutely true, is that without any one of these elements that happened, because it was so close, it would have failed. 
So without um, uh, some of the, the really generous pledges we got and the pledge increases we got and the almost 200 new people that we got within the last you know, 24 to 48 hours um, and mm. the fact that I happened to think of this idea of doing a kickathon for the last 24 hours. You know, if that hadn't happened and we hadn't supported other projects that we were excited about and, and wanted to, to kind of share with the world, and if, if uh, um, you know, Fergus Urquhart from um, Project Eternity and, and Obsidian hadn't mentioned it to his, uh, to his own team and, and if they hadn't contributed, there were about 18 of them that contributed, some of the, the fans and players that have been uh, you know, very much supporters of the game that drew deep and, and you know, put in $250 you know, toward a pledge. That was huge. The difference of how, we, how much we, pled, uh, we funded by was less than $250. So any one of those pledges was the reason that we <laughs> funded. So the, the depth of my appreciation and, and thankfulness of all of that outpouring of support is, is really remarkable. It's one of the most it's one of the most encouraging times in my life in terms of of how thankful I am for people pulling together for for something creative for a creative endeavor, and so um, that's my take on it. <laughs> do you, do you think Kickstarter um, mm. represents a, a pretty neat shift in terms of how uh, independent developers can get games made? Um, would would this have been possible? To make sort of Fargo two without some sort of crowdfunding uh, site like that. Certainly, in in our particular circumstance, I mean, Fargo is is a little bit of an unusual creature, no pun intended, in that. Uh, and, and on one level, it's a very you know simple seeming game that you know it's meant to appear and be graphically simple and approachable and. And traditional, or, or or I should say, retro, and its experience. But because it, it's it's a game that has a, a, an immense amount of depth, and that depth and how you code to be able to make it feel deep and be experienced longer. I mean, we we repeatedly hear the comment from people that it's one of the the, the games that people keep on their devices longer than on, almost any other game, and and. Uh, you know, to, to have that kind of experience with it means that it, it takes an awful lot of work to do, um, particularly on Paul's part. And, and because of that, I think Fargo would have had a real struggle, certainly getting it done anytime soon, without Kickstarter. Uh, and it may not be quite as true for games that are a little bit more kind of Come out with a big bang and have a great, you know, short run, and and are are fun and and delightful to play, but maybe don't have the depth and the just the amount of complexity of, of how hard they are to code. Um, Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, I mean that that pretty much nails it. Um, if we were a bigger team, you know, if we were an actual studio, we're not really studio per se, I mean we just all work from home or wherever, um, then you know, maybe these things wouldn't even be that much of an issue, but we're just, you know, a couple guys here making a game kind of thing. And and you know, this is this is really what the the, uh, the independent developers are all struggling with now is just how to make their you know their ideas and, and, and the things they want to express, how to make those those happen. So yeah, it's the uh, Probably the the starving artist of the 21st century situation here. <laughs> so well, yeah, I mean, Kickstarter definitely is is a is something that that can help. I don't know how for how long. I mean, I'm just worried that it may get saturated. You see a lot of these bigger and bigger um, companies and and so forth are, are are using it, and they have more visibility. They get they get lots of pledges, and then the little guys kind of get shifted down the down the line. So. You know, we'll see how it goes in, in the next few years if, if Kickstarter is still viable for uh, independent developers and if we're even still around. But, you know, grabbing the reins right now while we can. 
Well, I would say this, that, that the idea of a smaller campaign like ours is, uh, is every bit as important for us to understand how to, to get the word out to not only our fans, but new discoverers. And, and so in a, in a way, we're kind of faced with some of the same publicity challenges that any large organization would and coming up with with new ways to get the word out and be discovered and I mean even just the idea that uh, uh, Eric you discovered it I mean you had known about the game uh, but because we did the Kickathon event and then therefore as a chain reaction uh, Fergus and his team tweeted about it and as a chain reaction you then thought to yourself oh wow there's that that thing I had wanted to write about you know that's that's something that's the result of of some important outreach that we did to try to to get discovered and and um, so it's that same it's the same philosophy about any independent developer that for example is has a an iOS title and wants to get onto the iPhone or or um, iPad one of the the real challenges for them is that they have to be discovered amidst a huge number of other games and so they have to understand how to to talk to the press and how to um, uh, to to reach out to fans and be very supportive and, and interactive and and they need to know all of those tools to get discovered just like anybody uh, doing a Kickstarter campaign would. So what's the um, sort of to wrap things up? I suppose what's the what what are the next steps for you guys? What um, what are the next few months or uh, you know the leading up to the release of the game going to look like? For me, certainly, it's it's going to be uh, our immediate uh, fulfillment of the the wonderful rewards and things that we've that we've set up for people to receive as supporters for for the game, and so. We're furiously working on all of those uh, fulfillment tasks and, and getting uh, Charlie going on the art and, and uh, doing a lot of the communications around talking to backers and things like that. So, so there's going to be a solid amount of time that I'll be spending on that. And, uh, and of course, Paul, you'll be uh, getting your nose back into the, the code full force and We'll of course be structuring it so that we have a really uh, you know, organized approach, so that we can start getting the developer forums or, or the backer forums, so that people can talk to us about game content. Um, working toward our, our private beta for some of the higher level backers. Uh, so there's there's just a lot of uh, of really solid and organized work toward meeting our our uh, our delivery goals. Okay. Um, well, I think that that about does it for me. Is there anything else you guys wanted to talk about or wanted to add? Or um, I would uh, would like to mention the the project I'm just finishing up right now. Yeah, right. that'd be great. Yeah, go for it. So I've been working with Rocket Cat Games in the interim. Um, they're a, a small independent uh, group, a lot like us. Um, they've had a, a few uh, pretty decent uh, little successes with uh, with the Hook Champ series of games, and uh, more recently uh, Mage Gauntlet, all for uh, iOS. And we've been working on Punch Quest, and uh, that's just been approved, and it will be out October 25th. And um, basically, it's all about punching things. If you like to punch things, if you like to punch the heads off skeletons and the guts out of zombies and uh, <laughs> Swat bats out of the air with your fist, then uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, cool. it's uh, pretty cool. I'm going to be taking a lot of that effort and putting it back into Fargo too, as well. For all the things, new things that I've developed and learned while working on Punch Quest will help to um, enhance and, uh, and and streamline the the work on uh, Fargo too. And if people search on YouTube, they can find some really fun trailers for uh, the upcoming Punch Quest. Uh, uh, I I'm just thrilled with with how that's going to be and I can't wait to to uh, uh, download it myself um, and uh, and play it because because I know how hard Paul's been working on getting uh, that out um, I wanted to mention also how, how the Fargo team besides Paul and myself 
is actually um, uh, a really fun team to be working with. We we also have uh, Charlie Canfield, who is an animator and um, uh, has won a, an Emmy Award for uh, one film that he uh, did some animation for. Uh, uh, he's he's our kind of our general uh, game interface artist. Paul does all the pixel work within the actual dungeon itself, but Charlie does all those wonderful kind of uh, almost uh, Chagall-like illustrations of uh, and, and animations for the opening animation for the game and, and some of the other key uh, elements. And then, of course, we have some great new music that's going to be included in the game. One of our um, real supporters all these years has been uh, Daniel Pemberton, who is a uh, London-based uh, composer, and Daniel is actually also very well known. He um, has done a lot of uh, music tracks for BBC shows, including uh, the new version of Upstairs Downstairs, and uh, he also did the music for um, Little Big Planet, uh, which is another big game title. And and Daniel has been very gracious to work on our little game and it really enhances the play experience because you have all this wonderful orchestral music that sets the mood in the dungeon. So you're going to hear several new Daniel Pemberton titles uh, as well as a couple of outside um, new musicians that have done some tracks for, for some of the dungeon levels. So uh, overall, we tend to be a team that, that works with really highly talented people and uh, and that's one of the things I enjoy most about my task, which is uh, working with those people and helping to art direct and, and uh, things like that. So uh, my thanks goes out to them for also being longtime uh, Fargo contributors. <laughs> so. Oh, cool. Yeah, Little Big Planet. That's a, that's got an interesting soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, it's very quirky. Uh, yeah. Daniel's work is really good. Uh, we love it a lot. And it really, I mean, the music in Fargo, Daniel's music in Fargo really sets the mood, I think, in the in the modern uh, version, you know. Yeah. We've still got all our chippy, blippy stuff going on with the sound effects uh, and the monster kind of Jaws sound, but uh, but the music, I think, it really pulls a lot of people in. We've had a lot of comments about, about the music and how they love it, so we'll be happy to get that up on uh, Bandcamp for them uh, shortly. That's right. Cool. All right, well, uh, I really appreciate you guys' time. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting project. Well, Thank we're you. really delighted that you've you've uh, kind of uh, brought us to the the forefront, and 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 it's been really fun following your coverage of it. Um, and and we look forward to giving you some nice exclusives as we get uh, closer to release time as well. Very cool. All right. Well, um, we'll take care and good luck. And uh, this was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. All right. See ya. Yeah. Bye.